If you have your Bibles in Acts chapter number 8, we are continuing to go through the, the, the book of Acts. We've gone through chapter by chapter. We'll be finishing the 8th chapter today. As we look verse by verse at what was happening in the new church, we call this book the Acts of the Apostles. I've called this series the, the Acts of New Holland. Because we too, like them, look to Jesus as our Savior and Lord. To be our everything. To be our God. And we want to, to line up and we want to be obedient unto Him. We want to have a culture of Christ. Everything has its culture. In our world today, there are big churches and little churches. There are country churches and city churches. There are mega churches. There are churches that are meeting now online. There was a church three years ago that I know of that met for an entire year on Zoom. Could you imagine? I couldn't. I mean, I remember when the, we had to shut down and I couldn't believe that we missed Resurrection Sunday and, and, and I just couldn't. I said, no, no, we're going to start back. We're going to start back. And I, I set the date and the governor's office said, it wouldn't be good to do that quite yet. So we, 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 did, we were obedient, weren't we? And we, we kicked it back a little further and I said, the first opportunity we get, we're coming back together, all 20 of us. And we've grown a little bit since then. We've been told that uh, our culture's been changed. Some people say, well, we, we just want it to be like it was before. I don't. I want it to be better. I want it to be whatever God so chooses to bring us. I really don't worry about the circumstances of life. I care more about the culture of my heart. I care about the culture of our church. Who are we? Why do we do what we do? Are we doing it to bring glory and honor unto Him? Are we doing it as we could and as we should? This word culture means a lot. Churches have culture. It's an attitude. It's a belief. It's a custom. It's a tradition, yes. Churches have traditions. It's a ritual. Look at your bulletin. It's a heritage. It's something that we observe. It's a precedent. Precedent. As a matter of fact, the early Christians were called the way. It's a common belief. It's a way of doing things that are practiced by individuals and it's accepted by the whole. Real quickly, I can walk into any church anywhere, and in a matter of minutes, I can tell you the culture of the church. I can tell you the attitude of the believers. I had one person, a wise person, said when he would go to a church, he could tell the attitude of the church when they looked at the pastor's wife. I thought, that's interesting. You'd have to go downstairs to look at her this morning. And I thought, you know, that's probably about right. Don't look at the pastor. He can put on a good front. How many of y'all know pastor's wives can't put on a good front? They just, whatever you see, that's really a reflection of what's going on in their life, what's going on in their husband's life, what's going on in the church. I've expanded that. I can look at the deacons. I can look at the teachers. I can look at those that come early. I can look at those that come late. I mean, part of that's just the human nature of people. I can tell you by the songs that we sing. I can tell you by the style of the preacher. I can tell you by how you uh, things look in the church and how things look in the parking lot and I can tell you all those little things, and it, you can tell what is important to people. Every organization strives to have a healthy culture, which extends the purpose and the belief instilled in it. As I was thinking about this, I, I was thinking about a, a business that I like. 
I believe it's one of the most successful fast food chains out there. How many of you know what I mean when I say Chick-fil-A? Uh, did y'all hear yourself? Y'all didn't say, uh-huh. You went, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How many of you like a chicken sandwich? Now, I don't know about the carrots and raisins. Can I be honest? I mean, come on, I don't want to spend $5 for carrots and raisins, but I'll spend it for a chicken sandwich. Amen, hallelujah, praise God. There will be chicken in heaven at the marriage supper of the Lamb. I'm a Baptist preacher. We're, there will be fried chicken involved. But when I think about Chick-fil-A, I think about quality food. I think about what I call superior service and a very welcoming, polite, friendly, helpful employees. A few years ago when the pandemic hit, they had to shut down the inside. Just like everybody else, you couldn't go inside. But they opened the doors up. Now, could you imagine a successful business like Chick-fil-A trying to continue the culture that they had built in those circumstances? What I found out was they did their very best. It was like everybody had to go to one cash register. And have, we had to go to those speakers outside and try to talk to one person. And they would cook the food and make it hot. Could you just imagine? There, look, there's another place in this town that I love their food, but I'm never going back. 35 minutes in line and they give me the wrong food, I'm not going back and I'm not telling you what it was either. Amen? Now, what they said was we got to shift. What our culture is, is outstanding food, quality service, polite, welcoming Kind people. So they built that drive-in like nothing else. They put real people outside. They had a tent over them so you could do it, even if you had to wait, where you wouldn't have to do it in the rain. They, they had the two lanes already. Matter of fact, since then, they've totally restructured it. But could you imagine all those things going through? And the only problem about it was everybody in town went there. And you still had to wait in line. But this is what got me. They made up their mind that they were not going to let circumstances change who they had become. The early church had been changed by Christ. Those people became new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. And the very first thing that they faced was tribulations, heartache, People were still getting saved. People were getting healed. And yet the old culture, the old tradition, the same people that crucified Jesus didn't, wanted to stop it as best that they could. Two weeks ago, we talked about the problem that they had with the, the widows there and, and the servicing. So they came up with a solution to make sure that people matter. You know Why? Listen to your pastor. Because people matter. And they served them and served them well. And one of those deacons went out and, and just loved on people. And a group of people started asking them questions and he told them the truth and they didn't like him. So he preached one of the most fantastic sermons ever preached. I mean, just scripturally great. And you know what they did? They killed him for it. And you know what? It excited the Christians even more. And they were scattered. And they started to go in different places. And last week, we talked about another one of those deacons. I love deacons who have a sermon in their heart. He goes to a place that, that, that other people didn't even like these people, the Samaritans. They called them dogs. But Jesus loved them. Jesus liked them. And the Holy Spirit showed up, and people started getting saved. And in the midst of a, what I would call a great awakening, a wonderful heaven shows up. The glory of God's falling down. People's lives are being changed. People are getting excited about knowing the almighty God who loved them and shed his blood for them. And in that moment, God spoke to Philip again. 
you have your Bibles, I'm not going to make you stand up. We're going to look through all of this real quickly. Look in verse number 26, Acts chapter 8, verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, Arise and go towards the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. Lord, did I get you right? Is this angel telling me the truth? I was obedient. I left Jerusalem. I went to Samaria. People are getting saved. Lives are getting changed. Cities are going upside down for the Lord God. Why should I leave this place? This is a wonderful place. This is what we've been praying for. We're seeing answered prayer every day. You want me to do what? You want me to go where? To the desert? You think he asked this question? I know Brian Stevens would have. Why? Are you punishing me? You know, this may be news to you. Preachers like crowds. I like it that y'all come. Now, for those of you who who just are showing up just for the sake of showing up, y'all go ahead and go to sleep. It'll be fine. You ever gotten permission from the pastor to go to sleep? You might as well. You're going to go sleep anyway. Amen? (laughs) Wives, don't nudge. Let them sleep. And be all right. Amen? Because I have full conviction that the Lord will wake them up for at least 30 good seconds. And I I believe God can speak in 30 seconds. Amen? Well, that wasn't a strong amen, but I believe He can. But understand, I like crowds, and He's going to send them to the desert. So he goes to the desert. He is obedient. This may not make sense, humanly speaking, but, you know, God has a way of doing some amazing things that don't make sense. Isaiah 55 verse 9 says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And to that I say amen. Uh, God doesn't need my approval. I need, he, what he needs from me is my obedience. And if he tells me to go to the desert, guess what? I need to go to the desert. We don't always agree with God, but do we act upon God's leading if we agree with him or not? Here's the term we've been talking about every week. One accord. One accord. Every week we've been talking about this one accord. It's a compound word. It's literally one word in the Greek But the one word is made up of two words. Here are what the two words mean. To rush along, the second word means in unison. To rush along together in unison. Now that could be in unison with God, amen, in unison with each other. As we seek to gather together with God and quickly do whatever He's leading us to do. Quick obedience, no arguments, no fusses. Immediately saying, God, if this is what you want, that's what is best, I'm with you. And when the church does this, come on, when the church builds a culture of obedience with God and doing it together, rushing along to do God's will, rushing along to do it together, amazing things can happen. So look what the Bible says in verse 27. So he arose and went. No fights, no arguments. Do you think that pleased God? He sent the angel to speak to Philip, and you know what? He's like, I don't understand, but guess what, God? You're God and I'm not. This has got to be good. So I'm with you, Lord. Let's go to the desert. And what what happens next can only be described is what I would call a divine encounter. Look what it says in verse 27. And behold, every time we're obedient, look out for that behold, because we're going to find out. We might not understand, but God's going to help us to find out. He's going to help us to understand. Behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, great authority, under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians who had charge of all her treasury. 
and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning. Guess where he was going through? If he's going back to the continent of Africa, he's going to have to go south from Jerusalem, and he's going to go the Gaza way through the desert. God knew who was going to be there. And praise God that that person mattered to God. He had a heart. He had a soul. He mattered. He was important. You know what God was doing here? Let me give you a, the little footnotes here. What God was doing was bringing the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ to the continent of Africa. And it began with one soul. Philip and another soul. We don't even know his name, but it was the right one. And God cared. He had a longing in his heart to worship. He had gone to Jerusalem like a lot of people come to churches and they come because there's a longing in their heart. But maybe when they get there, the culture's not good. And maybe, maybe they're, 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 they've been doing things for a long time, but maybe they've lost what is important. And this man is returning without answers, just questions. And as he is this, this man of great influence, he's, he's over the treasury of all of Ethiopia. He is right underneath the queen herself. We know her name. Candace. And he is reading in that chariot that he's riding in, he is reading the prophet Isaiah, verse 28. Then the Spirit said, Hey, Philip, go near and overtake the chariot. So you know what he did? I love this. Verse 30. So Philip ran. Now, hold on. This is an official chariot. I mean, it, he's got people in front, people behind. I mean, you can tell this has got, it's kind of like got the flag on it, so to speak. I mean, you can tell this is dignitaries. And here's old Philip, just an old deacon, right? And, he, and the, But the Spirit says, hey, go join them. So you know what he does? He doesn't argue. He's not like Moses. You know, Moses is like, I don't know if I can do this. I don't talk well. You Can't you find somebody more qualified? No. When you're being spirit-led, you don't worry about what he's asking you to do. You just say, yes, Lord. And I love this. It says that he ran. He didn't go, well, okay, whatever you want me to do, Lord. He ran almost with excitement. Look, if you've, had, if you've been to a place like Samaria, people are getting saved left and right. Maybe you got something in your spirit that says, I wonder what God's going to do now. And that wonderment is there. He says, Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? He said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. Now, hold on. Philip didn't pull out his resume and said, uh, I can explain this to you. I have my PhD in Jesus. He just says, do you understand? How can I? So immediately they welcomes him right up in the chariot. And they're sitting down. And I'm what, I, I guess there's this looking people over. Philip's looking him over and that guy's looking him over. But God was there. It wasn't just two people looking at each other. It was the Holy Spirit that was in charge. I'm so grateful that I don't have to make this happen. I'm so grateful that when I get up to preach, I mean, y'all know me, there's not much there. But isn't it amazing that God can use an old donkey like me? I mean, if an old donkey can speak, praise God, hallelujah, and amen. If it's the Holy Spirit. And it always has amazed me that it's not how good the speaker is. It's how good the word is. It's not how good the delivery is. It's how much it is accepted. 
You know, there's a lot of people that are going to churches and they're hunting the right preacher. Just find the right message. They're looking for somebody that can represent God. Hey, I got a word for you. Just go straight to the source. You can meet him. You can know him. You can hear his whisper as well. You can pick up your Bible and guess what? The same Holy Spirit that speaks to me will speak to you. The same one that makes my heart jump up and worship. Look, y'all have heard me say this before. I, every time I see a penny, I pick it up. Number one, I'm a Baptist preacher, so I pick up every penny. But I've made a ritual out of it now because if it says heads, I give God great praise. Heads up. I give God great praise. If it's on tails, I understand that God wants me to be humble in that moment. Yesterday, I was walking through the Ingalls parking lot. Can I get an amen for the Ingalls parking lot? I was doing what my wife told me to do. Can I get an amen for doing what my wife told me to do? And I looked down there and I found a penny. And I picked it up. And for the next five to eight minutes, I gave the Lord the best praise I knew how to give Him. I mean, I'm walking through produce, thanking God for apples and the good things of life and how He can bring great taste into me and fill me up as I walk past the donuts. Did you hear the word past? Past the donuts. I praise God for who He is and for what He's done. I praise God that He's able to speak in ways that can find my heart and it's like I get plugged in. And I don't have to stop and say, it's time for worship, Almighty God. My heart just said, Lord, I love you. He doesn't care what version you read out of. You don't have to add these and thou's to your prayers. What he's looking is just a connection. And he said, how can I know unless somebody tells me? In this divine God encounter, get this, he finds the right person at the right place with the right preacher, with the word already opened up to, to the number one verses that I know of in the Old Testament that describe the work of Jesus Christ in the cross of Calvary. Isaiah 53. Wow! Do y'all believe in coincidences? I believe in the Almighty God. At just the right moment, at just the right place, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, as a lamb before His shears is silent, so He opened not His mouth. In His humiliation, His justice was taken away. And who will declare the, His generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does this prophet say this? Of himself or of some other man? That's almost like saying, saying sick him to a preacher. Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, and he preached Jesus to him. Y'all look up here. If you know Jesus Christ, you know the author. You know the beginning and the ending of the faith. If you know Jesus Christ, you know everything that you need to know to lead someone to Christ. You just get a great opportunity just to brag on Jesus. Who He is, what He did, how it changed you. What your life was like before, what your life was like when you met Christ, and what your life's been like since then. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. That's enough. That's enough. That's enough. That's enough. Just give them Jesus. Don't try to talk to them about all the problems in the world. Just give them Jesus. I know people that are more, they think it's more important to talk to people about church than talk to them about Jesus. Just give them Jesus. We'll work out the church part. Amen. I don't care. Don't talk to them about what version that they pray or they read out of. Just give them Jesus. Well, the Holy Spirit must have been there 
Because in verse 36, now as they went down the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? A man of Egypt. What keeps me from being baptized? I love the desire of his heart. Can I have this? That's what he's saying. Can I have this? Can I be baptized? When they came up on the water, verse 39, the Spirit, oh, excuse me, let's give it to verse 38. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. He baptized him, gave him a chance, gave him an opportunity. He became a new creation right then and there. Verse 39, I was reading it just a second ago. They came up out of the water and the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. Evidently, God had some other place that He wanted Philip to go. Another work. And a soul was saved. All you have to do is believe. Repent of your sins. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who came to earth to die on the cross of Calvary, to shed His blood, to forgive us of our sins. And then if we would be so willing to repent of our sins and give our life to Him, we can be made new. That's all it takes, folks. Another soul can be saved. Another life can be changed. Some people have been living in church so long they forgot the culture of Jesus. Some people think the only thing that's important is how we do church. What happens? Who's teaching? We forget that He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by Him. Job done. Glory to God. See, because I really believe that there's some people here today that they've been playing a game and they just need Jesus. I really do. <laughs> Philip truly believed Jesus is the Son of God. He had been changed by the saving power of God. He had experienced the goodness of God. The rest, restorative power of God had come into him. He had put joy within him. He had given him peace. And he yielded his life. And it really didn't matter what God asked him to do. He was willing to go to the Samaritans that everybody else called dogs because the love of Jesus Christ goes to everybody. Have you ever heard this verse? For God so loved the... Aren't you glad? And if God can change me, God can change anybody. If you want to see the picture of pride, just look right here. I had all the answers to all of life, and I could talk myself out of any situation. And then God said, no, you can't. And I found the end of myself, and when I found the end of myself, I found the beginning of God. And for 50 years, I've been doing a God walk. And my, ch my culture's been changed. My heritage has been changed. My life has been changed. I hold no greater allegiance than Jesus Christ, crucified, resurrected, in heaven, looking over me. All of this matters because of the backdrop of sin. Sin destroys, sin separates. Satan wants to divide and conquer. He always has. He always attacks relationships. He always wants us to let us know that God could never love us like that. God could never do an amazing work in our life. But understand this. Salvation is, is beautiful because it's against the backdrop of sin. We can't escape sin. We can only be saved from it. Church, listen, I close. If we forget that we're all about Christ, we need to close the doors. If we're more interested in the things of church than the things of God, 
we're bankrupt. If we only care about how things affect us, but we don't care about how things affect Christ, I don't know, but we've been going through the book of Acts chapter by chapter, and I keep hearing those words, one accord. And I think those two words that make it up, to rush along in unison, I think everything that we do as a church, we need to understand that we need to be chasing after Christ together. Together with Christ, together with each other for the glory of God. Now, if there's someone here that does not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, I would love to talk to you. I would not embarrass you. I would not. I would not be rude to you. I would be just as kind as I know how to be. I would talk to you in the same way that I would want someone to talk to my mom. But I'm telling you, it's important. And if you feel the need to talk, if you, need, if you feel the need to, that, that, that you're, you're running after something, but you haven't found it, <laughs> there's nothing I enjoy more than just helping people find the way, the truth, and the life in Jesus Christ. And I'm a living example. If he can change me, he can change anybody. In the next few moments, you're going to come up with, you're going to hear every excuse not to do it. Just make up your mind if you're ready to repent and receive what God can do for you. Others, there are going to be some things in your life that you, I heard an old preacher say one time, we've been walking a guilty distance. I don't want us to walk a guilty distance. I just want us to walk close to the fire. Close to where I can hear him, even if he whispers. You need to get to that.